Okay. Um, my name is Johnny Perez. I am a safe reentry advocate at the Urban Justice Center's Mental Health Project. And my role is that I connect people who are returning back into society from jails, hospitals, and prisons with services in society in order to help them reach the best measures of recovery. For myself, how I came into the work is that I served 13 years in prison, three of those years in solitary confinement. Today, what I would like to do is to talk to you specifically about solitary confinement. If you've never been in solitary confinement, you'll be surprised to know that the cell is very small, sort of like the size of two walking, two Walmart spaces placed together. It's so small that I used to stretch both of my hands out and touch both walls. In the summer, it gets real hot, so hot that you can actually see, just feel the wall sweat. It gets so cold in the wintertime that it makes it very difficult to sleep. And it gets quiet, so quiet that you can hear your own heartbeat. And sometimes it also gets so loud from the cacophony of different voices of other people who are yelling, screaming, crying inside of their cells that it actually drives people crazy, for lack of a better term. Some of the psychological effects that I encountered while I was placed in, in isolation for such a long time was just basically an increased sense of anger and hopelessness. I found myself crying a lot. I found myself punching walls. I found myself doing extraneous jumping jacks and push-ups and you know, just writing my anger out. Uh, one of the difficult things about solitary confinement is that there's little to no meaningful human contact. And for me, the only person who I came in contact with was the correction officer who served me food, you know, through the slat in the metal door inside of my cell. You know, the first meal was at 7 o'clock, the next meal was at 12, 12 in the afternoon, and the last meal being 4 o'clock in the afternoon. If you hold your food any time after that and the cell search comes, then, you know, you can be found guilty for being in possession of contraband, which in turn can lead to more solitary time. And this is important because this is the reason why someone can go into solitary for 90 days and end up in solitary for years, if not decades at a time. I mean, we live in a country where Alfred Woodbox spent 42 years inside of a cell. I'm 37 now. We also live in a country where the criminal age of responsibility is 16 years old in New York and North Carolina, two of the last states in our country. And what that means is that we can place 16-year-olds not only in solitary but also in adult prisons and subject them to this inhumane treatment. People should know that while in solitary, you know, there's little to no meaningful um, intellectual stimulation. I found myself, you know, uh, trying to just read anything, the back of toothpaste, or just reading my own writings that I decided to write. You know, and when I didn't have anything to read, I found myself counting the bricks on the wall. I found myself thinking about the past a lot. I thought, I thought about the future a lot. I found myself dreaming and thinking about alternate endings to a future that I had yet to encounter. Ten months later, when they opened the cell and I went back to solitary confinement into general population, I found myself being an introvert, where before I was more of an extrovert. I used to like to laugh and joke and, you know, just kind of get along with people, except that when I came out, solitary took some of that away from me. I found people hard to trust. I found myself not laughing and smiling at things that I used to laugh and smile about. My appetite changed. I lost a lot of weight while I was in solitary. I remember going in weighing 155 and coming out weighing about 130, 140 pounds. When it comes to coming out of solitary, you know, it's not as easy or straightforward as people might think, you know. First, you should know that there is no due process to even get into solitary in the first place. You can't cross-examine any evidence that placed you in solitary in the first place. Um, and you also find it hard to present witnesses. You know, in prison, you have to give the first and last name of a person who's a witness, except that everyone in prison usually goes by a nickname therefore making it difficult for you to even have someone as a witness during your hearing. People should also know that um, translators are very difficult to find in the correctional setting. Um, for this reason, people who uh, have English as a second language um, actually find themselves more often than not on the receiving end of solitary. And also, contrary to popular belief, people might think that it's only the most violent and the most aggressive who are in solitary, and that is absolutely not true. Four out of five offenses are completely minor offenses, you know, committed by people who are then placed in solitary. And these minor offenses can be very simple, like, you know, shooting spitballs at a correction officer or talking back or refusing what's called the direct order, when you find yourself on the receiving end of this torture. 
Right now, there are groups in New York City and around the nation who are working on this issue, specifically in a group that I am a part of also um, called the Campaign for Alternatives to Long-Term Isolated Confinement. And we have a piece of legislation which is going to radically change the way that we even use solitary confinement in New York State. And it's called the HALT Act. H-A-L-T for the Humane Alternatives to Long-Term Isolated Confinement. And it seeks to reduce solitary in three distinct ways. Number one, it limits who can be placed in solitary in the first place. So not only the 16-year-olds that I told you about earlier, but also women who are expecting children who here in New York State we place in solitary. Also, people who are developmentally disabled, people who are uh, severely mentally ill, and also people who identify with the LGBTQ community who once they you know, um, expose their lifestyle to cor in correctional settings, they're actually placed at a high likelihood of being placed in solitary and also at a high likelihood of being victimized by the general population. So we really don't want these people in solitary. And more importantly, um, the, the second provision of the bill is that it limits the amount of days in which people can spend in solitary in the first place, which brings it in line with world views around torture, specifically the United Nations Repertoire on Torture, uh, the former um, Juan Mendez, who deemed anything over 15 days to be, to be considered torture. You know, but here in New York and in our country, we place people for days, months, years, even decades at a time. So we really want to limit the amount of days that people spend in solitary to 15 days. And then lastly, you know, we have to ask a question about what kind of society do we want to be? We're very grateful to be able to collaborate and partner um, with other you know, organizations and other groups, specifically um, NIRCAT, the, the National Religious Campaign Against Torture, who has done a lot of work to advance you know, and raise awareness about the inhumane use of uh, solitary confinement. And also the social workers against solitary confinement, which you know, they really recognize and really value you know, not only um, the being able to bring you know, services to the people who are currently incarcerated, but also just to stop the inhumane use of solitary you know, and just the stop of torture altogether. Um, again, my name is Johnny Perez, Safe Reentry Advocate at the Urban Justice Center's Mental Health Project, and I am a survivor of solitary. Thank you.